Good evening. My name is Patrick Riley, and as an International House resident, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's Global Voices Author Night Lecture with Jose Orduña. This event is sponsored by the Global Voices Lecture and Performing Arts Series, the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Esplan, the Organization of Latin American Students at UChicago, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Seminary Co-op employees will be selling copies of Mr. Orduño's book after the lecture. Tonight's event is one of over 200 public programs held every year at International House. These include music and cultural performances, outreach programs with Chicago area organizations, collaborations with foreign consulates, language exchanges and discussions, and debates led by distinguished Global Voices speakers. Information about upcoming events can be found on the literature table by the front entrance. We are now very excited to hear tonight's guest, Jose Orduña, discuss his new memoir, The Weight of Shadows. Mr. Orduña was born in the Mexican state of Veracruz. At age two, his parents brought him to Chicago, where he grew up without legal status. In The Weight of Shadows, Mr. Orduña reflects on the difficulties of growing up in this situation and challenges us to reconsider our views of race, class, and the American identity. Please join me in welcoming him to International House. Thank you, uh, Patrick, and thank you, International House, for hosting this event. Uh, it's nice to see familiar faces, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I'll just uh, begin briefly by uh, talking a bit about the context in which the book was written, um, and then I think I'll just go ahead and read uh, uh, an excerpt, and then I'd like to open it up for questions, uh, and leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. So I'll start with a, a wonderful quote by the Indian author Arundhati Roy, uh, and this was written in 2003. You may think it's bad manners for a person like me, officially entered in the big book of modern nations as an Indian citizen, to come here and criticize the US government. Speaking for myself, I'm no flag waver, no patriot, and I'm fully aware that banality, brutality, and hypocrisy are imprinted on the laden soul of every state. But when a country ceases to be merely a country and becomes an empire, then the state of operations changes dramatically. So may I clarify that I speak as a subject of the American empire. I speak as a slave who presumes to criticize her king. So I found that quote to be incredibly powerful and uh, somewhat inspiring uh, for the writing of this book. Uh, the other day on Monday, I gave a reading at Cornell College in the small bucolic town of Mar Mount Vernon, Iowa. The small tree-lined streets looked like a postcard but my appreciation of the serenity was precluded by the email I received before arriving. Someone spray painted, build a wall, make it tall, in a conspicuous and shared space on campus. It wasn't because of the reading. Uh, the students there said that it was just one of many incidents of the same nature that had been happening on campus. A student there wrote on her blog, quote, Cornell's administration acknowledges discrimination only in its most extreme forms swastikas, nooses, slurs, end quote. This was true at Cornell, and it's true in the United States of America. Nowhere in our national discourse, the discourse manufactured by the corporate media, is there a collective grappling with the core of the issue that we refer to when we say immigration. Because at the very core of this issue is a central contradiction for liberal democracy. What does it mean to reserve the right to exclude people based on their country of origin and class while our Constitution ensures equal protection? What does it mean that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes that it's the right of every individual to leave the nation in which they live, but they have nowhere to arrive? Donald Trump plays the villain, while our sitting president, a so-called progressive, former civil rights attorney and community organi organizer, has, deport has deported 2.5 million people, more than any other US president to come before him, and nearly more than every other 20th century president combined. Around 1,000 people are deported every day, 23% more than George W. Bush. 
What does it mean when NAFTA and CAFTA trade policies that decimated the Mexican and Central American poor and compelled their migration were signed into, into law by Bill Clinton, a Democrat, not a Republican? This is the reality in which we find ourselves as working class immigrants. Families are torn apart, individuals without the correct documents are subject to a brutal double standard that has been written into law. People are thrown into extrajudicial and indefinite incarceration, and they face the most extreme forms of regulation, surveillance, and exclusion by both political parties. Moments like these require communities to organize around specific political goals, like pushing for university divestment from companies that make their bread and butter from immigrant detention and surveillance and border militarization, and companies that support the militarized carceral state. It's necessary to take a critical look at some of the current immigrant rights campaigns and begin to reorient the grassroots in a push for legalization measures without conditions that, without conditions that throw parts of our community under the bus or allow for further militarization of our country's borders. Why shouldn't working class people without a college degree over a certain age or with a criminal record be extended the same protections being pushed for by dreamers? Don't these working class people also have dreams? Don't they deserve justice and dignity too? I wrote The Weight of Shadows in this context during the process of becoming a United States citizen. And I'll be reading from a later chapter called Disappearing Act. It comes after I'm sworn in as a US citizen. You'll hear reference to the desert because the previous chapter takes place in southern Arizona in the Sonoran Desert, or what Border Patrol refers to as the Tucson sector, where through various policies, starting with Operation Gatekeeper under Clinton, migrants were funneled into the areas of the border with the harshest terrain, where it was clear that they would be the most likely to die. So this is an excerpt from the chapter titled uh, Disappearing Act. I'm just going to find my water. So this is um, an excerpt from chapter 10 titled Disappearing Act. And it begins with a uh, it begins with a quote from a musical group uh, called Manu Chao. When they look for me, I'm not here. When they find me, it's not me. Manu Chao. Jody was 33 and I was 13, a gap wide enough to make our realities distinct in essential ways, but not wide enough to foreclose our mutual enjoyment of certain things. We enjoyed, for example, spending afternoons playing 21 with the kids from the neighborhood, not just because we liked basketball, but because we enjoyed hearing those very young boys curse with virtuosity. We also enjoyed sharing music. We traded tapes and CDs, and sometimes when we were at home together, we would take turns playing albums or picking radio stations. I think we liked it because it was a shortcut to learning about each other as people, about our tastes and pleasures, things that are often lost in the rigid communion between parents and their children. There was something alluring about hearing tracks she was into that were recorded and popular before I was born, especially tracks I wouldn't have imagined her liking. That kind of surprise suggested there were many things I didn't know about her, that there were parts of Jody's world that existed before me, beyond me. One day after school, we were hanging out at home, something that happened less and less because she'd started working well into the evenings. A friend, a friend who was a few years older than I was had given me a tape he'd made, and I played I played it over and over on a small boombox I kept on my bed for listening to a call on radio show about sex when I was supposed to be going to sleep. It was a mix of stuff like Jaguares, Monotobe, and El Tri. I remember bringing out the boombox, the tape already in it from the previous night, and pressing play. The last third of Que no te haga bobo Jacobo blared from the speakers. The track was about Jacobo Sabrudowski, Mexico's first anchor man who held the overwhelming majority of news viewers for Televisa for three decades starting in 1970, two years after the massacre of students in Tlatelolco by the state. Jacobo, as he came to be known by nearly everyone in New Mexico and by much of Latin America, was also commonly known to be a stooge for the PRI, the party that had been in power since the end of the 20s and had been responsible for Tlatelolco. The PRI would go on to run the country for seven uninterrupted decades despite the massacre. Jolie had been chopping something for dinner but as soon as she heard the name Jacobo, she put the knife down 
and started following the voice on the boombox. I had no idea who Sabrudowski was at the time. I had a cursory awareness of politics because Martin and Jolie left cartoon books like Marx para Principiantes and several other used comic books lying around the house. I flipped through them and because I liked the cartoons and funny captions, I also read parts here and there, understanding very little but finding them enjoyable. I remember liking the drawings of Marx's oversized head and beard and the way Rius mashed animation styles on the same page. But the track about Sabrudowski was the first time I got a, a specific glimpse of a particular political situation. The next track came on, Me llaman el desaparecido. Jolie turned from the counter and watched me bobbing my head along with the plinky guitar for a moment before going to the boombox and pressing stop. Sabes de qué se trata eso, she asked, pointing with the kitchen knife. I don't remember exactly what she said. Her explanation was abridged because I was 13, but she didn't completely skip the kind of information that produced a visceral reaction in my body. I had by that time already witnessed drive-by shootings and bodies being mangled in various ways. An arm broken with a baseball bat, a young man kicked unconscious while on the ground by a group, and someone shot in the throat. But this was different. I remember her repetition of El Estado. El Estado did this, El Estado did that. My previous encounters with violence had been traumatic to see, hear, be in the midst of, but all of them were perceived as transgressions, acts that violated the order we lived in. Jody's explanation didn't square with that, though. She was telling me that those who were in charge of establishing order had committed acts of extreme violence, final acts, acts against civilian youth, against estudiantes, she repeated. I remember feeling the pulse in my fingertips as I sat perfectly still, listening to her tell me about bodies being flown out over the ocean and dumped, and about a square line with sharpshooters opening fire into crowds of students. Folded into her explanation were suggestions that these acts of violence didn't begin and end with what happened to bodies, but included what stories were told or not told, and what stories were inscribed in official records. Shortly after learning about Tlatelolco, about the enduring Latin American tradition of student massacres, my mom and dad took me to the National Museum of Mexican Art on 19th Street, where we went every few months when I was growing up. It was their way of not only immersing me in representations of our culture and ourselves, but of exposing me to histories and contexts that were often missing in the lessons I learned in school. Each visit, they would let me pick something from the gift shop. That time or sometime close to it, I chose a small rectangular refrig refrigerator magnet we kept on our fridge for over a decade. I didn't think much about it at the time. The image was of Remedios Varos painting Fenomeno, which she completed in 1962, one year before her death and six years before Tlatelolco. The painting is of a man in a shadow, except the shadow walks upright, filling the three-dimensional space of the man while he's confined to the flat parameters of the shadow world. Much has been written about Varo and her work, most of it centering on the role Freudian symbolism, alchemy, and mysticism played in her painting. She developed a complex network of symbols, a kind of po post-World War II allegorical style, where the Christian iconography of the High Renaissance was not discarded, but destabilized and redeployed. Interpretations of her works abound, and many rest on the primacy of her personal anxieties or resistance to the rigid subordination of women in Parisian surrealist circles. Many interpretations begin and end there, in the personal psychology of a female agent moving through European intellectual circles, commenting insularly without considering the influence of broader realities on her being. She experienced the beginning of the Spanish Civil War in her late 20s, and the outbreak of World War II less than a decade after that. And she landed in Mexico in 1941 during a burgeoning student movement on the steady march toward the Cold War. Whatever the intended meaning, the production of Phenomeno in the early 60s in Mexico is remarkable. It serves as a kind of spirit photograph, a depiction of the zeitgeist. It communicates a central phenomenon that would occur throughout Latin America in the following decades, the murder and disappearance of large swaths of the population by the state. After the desert, I go to Agua Prieta, Sonora to work at a migrant resource center run by a faith-based organization called Frontera de Cristo, staffed mostly by locals and a few volunteers from abroad. Aguapeta, a town just on the other side of the border of Douglas, Arizona, reminds me of Gary, Indiana, which I've driven through a few times, always on the way to someplace else. 
On my first day, a minister with the organization, a white man with wispy blonde hair and a calm face, took me to see the plaza, a large empty square in the middle of town with a few benches and trees, but not a soul anywhere. He explained things would probably be slow at the center because people captured in the Tucson sector were being transported hundreds of miles along the border and dumped elsewhere, a practice called lateral repatriation. Often people were repatriated in areas with active cartel warring, like Nuevo Laredo, where the Setas massacred 72 migrants in August 2010. I stay in the Frontera de Cristo trailer in Douglas with another volunteer, and I provided a girl's bicycle, small and purple, to ride from the trailer park down the Pan American Highway and across the border to the resource center. One morning, we ride into downtown Douglas a few hours before our shift to hang out in the public library. Half of Douglas looks like an old-timey tourist trap, and the main strip approaching the border is a concentration of fast food restaurants and big box stores. In the library, I pull several books about Latin America off the shelves and flip through them while drinking my morning coffee. A few minutes later, I come across a familiar image of a long upright shadow, three-dimensional and walking, trailed by a flattened man cast on a few brick steps as though he were the shadow, phenomenal. Seeing it gives me a chill because of the association to forced disappearances it's come to have for me and because it appears here like this now. For the next few days, I can't stop thinking about the painting as I sit in the mostly empty resource center and walk down desolate streets where people struggle to make their lives despite the conditions imposed by the wall and the logic of the states that erected the barrier. One afternoon when I walk into the center, which is really just a narrow hallway with a desk, refrigerator, and small area for donated clothes at the far end, there's a young man in his 20s who looks like my uncle Pablo, sitting in one of the plastic chairs along the wall. He has a square, athletic build and jet black hair and eyes. Next to him sits a young woman around the same age with a long black braid that has the intensity and shine of obsidian. She's wearing overalls and looks to be in the last trimester of pregnancy. I sit next to them and introduce myself. Angela, the young woman, tells me they're from Oaxaca and have been caught and released that same morning after signing some papers. The area around the actual port of entry, about 50 feet from the migrant center, is a concentration of activity. Adrián, the young man, stands and walks to the doorway of the center and looks out onto a wall of unknown faces, a few cars idling and circling, men waiting to see what comes across the line. Many towns across the border have illicit economies that revolve around kidnapping and extorting migrants, and that's part of the reason the center is in operation. But things have been quiet in El Aprieta for some time. I walk over and stand with Adrian, looking out onto the clogged street. He nods over at a pickup truck in the middle of the intersection. Standing on the bed of the truck with his hands on a turret-mounted machine gun is a federal cop in black tactical gear, black balaclava, and navy fatigues. I ask Adrian a question I already know the answer to. ¿Por qué no hay ni como mano? He answers, walking back to Angela, slipping his hand underneath her overalls and resting his hand on, and resting his hand on her rounded belly. No hay ni como. There isn't even how, how to make a living, how to feed your infant, how to make a life. Later, Adrian shows me a money order for $250. He explains that when they were booked, the folded bills he kept in his shoe were taken, and when they, when they were repatriated, they were given this money order. He asks if I could go with them to cash it, and I ask if Angela might want to sit, might want to wait at the center, but before I'm even done asking the question, She's already standing beside us, both of them shaking their heads no, firmly hand in hand. Cashing the money order becomes a task that ends several hours later with me crossing into the, into the United States and going to a branch of my bank about a mile from the border. As I'm going through the port of entry, I pass a turnstile gate and approach a desk with an old white man behind it. He looks hostile until I present my US passport card and answer his question about where I'm going and why in a voice he didn't expect from this body. He stops me short of finishing. All right, all right, he says, waving me through. My crossing takes less than three minutes, and the ease of it horrifies me. Walking toward the bank, I sweat all through my clothes, but I can't really feel the heat because my mind is cycling through Jolie and Martin, Angela and Adrian, Octavio, the group in the desert, and all the people I would never meet, all laboring to find a place in which they can exist. When I get back, it's evening, and I call to arrange a ride and bed for the couple at the migrant shelter nearby. The later it gets, the more agitated they seem, and it pains me that there's little else I can do. 
I heat up some food for them, two bean burritos, and give them each an apple. I sit along the row of white plastic chairs, not knowing what to say. They ask me questions about where I live and what I do, how I got into the United States and when. A squad car is parked in front of the port of entry. We watch dusk turn to night, staring at the red and blue lights blinking on a wall just beyond the door. Angela lays her head in Adrian's lap and he gently sweeps a few strands of hair from her face. My shift is over before the ride comes. Adrian shakes my hand and pulls me in for a hug. Angela hugs me and kisses me on the cheek. As I unlock my small bicycle from a short fence just outside, I look back and see an image that burns itself into my memory. Angela in her long sleeved shirt and overalls, standing the way very pregnant women do, her legs planted just wider than usual, her back slightly bowed, and Adrienne standing next to her with one hand under her elbow, the other resting on the small of her back, both of them crowned in white light from the long bare bulbs just overhead. As I ride back through the port of entry down the Pan American Highway, it begins to rain. I think about the severity of a woman as pregnant as Angela walking through the desert, about what has to be true in the consciousness of ordinary Americans in order for this to happen, and about how the couple's journey to this place began by being dislodged and displaced from somewhere they used to know as home. The rain picks up and the stream of water in the gutter in which I'm riding widens suddenly and nearly sweeps the tires out from under me. My first thought is to hope there isn't anyone walking in the wash right now, because surely they'll be swept away. Dogs bark in the distance as I turn off the highway toward the mobile home park. There are no street lights, so I ride the rest of the way in almost total darkness. That night I have a dream in which I see the face of a man I'd never met. When I wake up in the trailer the following morning, I don't remember, I don't remember anything about the dream, anything about what this man I'd conjured looked like, but for some reason I know it was the man whose sweatshirt I'd seen in the desert. Somewhere between Aravaca and Sasabe, I'd taken a long trek with another volunteer to leave gallons of water in a clearing that straddled the international line. The walk there was especially arduous. At a certain point, the only way to keep going in the direction we needed to go was to descend a sheer rock face about 15 feet into an arroyo that looked like it had just settled after the last heavy rain. The bed of the wash was covered in rocks, many of them loose, which ranged between the size of a dog and the size of a truck. For long stretches, the brush was so thick we couldn't see where we were stepping and I found myself praying we wouldn't find a rattlesnake. An hour into the hike, we stopped to take a drink from our canteens, crouching into a bit of shade cast by the wall of the wash. There was a shallow puddle between us with a lone green film covering the submerged stones and tan water spiders gliding along the surface, and below small oblong creatures darted along indiscernible paths, leaving small bubbles zigzagging upward in their wakes. I'd been surprised to see how green the desert was when I arrived, and I was surprised again to see so much life teeming in the small puddle. After a few minutes without speaking, my companion, having similar thoughts to mine, said it was a Eurocentric trope to mischaracterize the desert as a place of death. The Odom have always lived here. It's not the desert that's doing all the killing. We continued around a bend and saw a sheer rock face several hundred feet in the near distance. In front of it, there were a few strands of barbed wire stretched between wooden posts that were almost a story high, with enough space between them to maneuver if you had a partner to pull them apart. In the center of the shoddy fence was a brown sweatshirt snagged from the hood on a high barb and from a sleeve on a diagonally lower one, so that as we approached, it looked like a man making his way through. Neither of us said so, but we thought there was someone there. We were both arrested at the same moment of recognizing a human figure in the distance, and we both started to react as though it were a person, raising one of our gallons of water and quickening our step. To be visible means that we have been seen, or at least the potential to be seen by another exists, and when we are, our existence is confirmed by another's gaze. Whatever body filled that sweatshirt and whatever life animated that body refused to be unseen even in its absence. Although I didn't know anything about the person, any of the particularities that make an individual, their name, the place in which they originated, the circumstances under which they made their journey, the specific contours of their face, their favorite dish, whether or not they had any children, musical tastes, what they enjoyed doing in their free time, the timbre of their voice, the cadence with which they spoke, their wounds and their scars, I knew enough to know that this was no place for that person. Many South and Central American migrants today are displaced by reverberations of the same military incursions 
violence and instability that produced the desaparecidos during the Cold War proxy wars of the second half of the 20th century. Mexico's economy and the fate of large portions of its domestic labor force have long been dominated by the United States. Most recently, NAFTA and other trade agreements implemented in the early to mid-90s have had disastrous effects on some of Mexico's most vulnerable populations. A report published by the Carnegie Endowment found that, quote, agricultural trade liberalization linked to NAFTA is the single most significant factor in the loss of agricultural jobs in Mexico, end quote, and that by the end of the at the end of 2002, Mexican agriculture lost 1.3 million jobs. The same report found that real wages in Mexico are lower today than when NAFTA took effect. By the late 1990s, nearly half of all employed Mexicans were employed in the informal economy, which is vaguely defined by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development as, quote, units engaged in the production of goods or services with the primary objective of generating employment and incomes to the persons concerned, end quote. Which means chewing gum vendors, street musicians, shoe shiners, squeegee people, and the men and women who sell foam lizards on lengths of wire to tourists are not, are, are not considered unemployed. With major job losses, no unemployment insurance, and a fall in real wages, rural households already struggling to survive were pushed completely into abject poverty. The first phase in the disappearance, the first phase in this disappearance is to be made redundant by the economic policies agreed upon by the oligarchs of increasingly cooperating states. As a redundancy, one is made invisible in plain sight, that is, invisible to the civic body in which one continues to exist. Someone turned into a walking shadow, with the dimensionality of a person, but without the possibility of recognition. What happens to migrants in the Sonoran Desert and long before they go, they get into the desert is not an accident, it's the letter and spirit of policy. By eschewing realism, one of the things Phenomeno prophesizes is the process of this kind of disappearance, one that begins in place without the vacating of a body. When one thinks of a shadow, one typically imagines an absence, a type of nothing, but this is fundamentally wrong. In Bado's painting, the visual space where the viewer assumes a man once was, or should be, is occupied by a shadow. The black three-dimensional figure fills the rounded contours of the body, except it's made of darkness. The darkness walks while the image of the man is relegated to the flat world of silhouette. A shadow is not the absence of light, but a relationship of light with itself and with an observer. This is why we can see shadows within shadows and the textures of objects and surfaces upon which shadows are cast. This is why shadows do not exist in totally dark rooms. Nevertheless, our association of shadows with nothingness remains. Nothing is supposed to signify no one, no place, and no thing. Not anything, not at all, no single thing. Yet when we investigate what's referred to by nothing, we invariably find something. In a shadow, for example, there's always light and it's blue. Not always the same blue because it changes depending on the distances between objects, light sources, and observers, but some light always radiates into the area alleged to be absent of it. If we think about the physical sciences, a vacuum is often synonymous with and supposed to represent a kind of nothing, but even the most sophisticated laboratory equipment and processes cannot evacuate space of everything. In fact, in the discipline of physics, a vacuum is not understood to be nothing, but rather only a space absent of particles with which photons are known to interact. When we think there's nothing, we always find something. A disappearance is said to have occurred when something ceases to be visible. In cases of human disappearance, this definition could not be farther from the truth. When a person disappears, the missing becomes hyper-visible, hyper-present. In Argentina, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, a group of women whose children were disappeared by the military junta of the 1970s, continue to visit police stations holding worn photographs and articles of clothing of their disappeared children, demanding to know where, what, how, and why. Some of the adolescent siblings of the desaparecidos say when their brothers or sisters were taken, they were made orphans because their parents disappeared too, psychologically and emotionally, never able to think about anything but the missing, never out of an excruciating cycle of compulsive thoughts. If their disappeared children lived at home, some of the mothers have kept guard over their rooms making sure that not one object is touched or moved, not one open book closed, not one pen capped. Ashtray sipped full for 40 years. 
The missing do not truly disappear until those who surrounded them, those who felt deeply for them one way or another, are gone too. One of the most common human practices across cultures through millennia is the enactment of funereal rituals that center on the body of the departed. Not everyone buries their dead, but everyone has the need to mark the passage from life to death by acknowledging the evacuation of personhood and viewing the stillness of the body, attempting to ensure happiness in the afterlife by adorning the body, granting safe passage into another world by cleansing the body, for forging closure and speaking goodbyes to the body, ensuring entrance to the afterlife by anointing the body, precipitating the voyage to another realm by destroying the body. Without the body, the desperate mind latches under the most unlikely of hope against all reason. Without the body, or at the very least, without the knowledge of death having occurred, it's difficult, if not impossible, for loved ones to find closure. The trauma of ambiguous loss is daily inflicted anew. It remains a gaping wound that will never close, never heal, never cease to excruciate. To this day, the mothers roam, to this day, mothers roam the Atacama, a vast desert spanning 105,000 square kilometers, combing the arid grounds, looking for fragments of their sons' and daughters' bones. The total number of people who have died attempting to cross the U.S.-Mexico border is unknowable. According to Customs and Border Protection, there were 6,330 southwest border deaths between October 1st, 1998 and September 30th, 2014, but this number is all but certainly low. The figures for any given period vary depending on the source. When asked about the discrepancies by a reporter for the Arizona Republic, Frank Amarillas, a Border Patrol spokesman for the Tucson sector, said the Border Patrol counts deaths encountered only by agents or deaths referred to them by local law enforcement officials. We're not notified in every case, he said. Other cases do not meet the narrow criteria for being counted by CBP. William Robbins, Border Patrol spokesman for the Yuma sector, told the Arizona Republic that in order to be counted, skeletal remains had to be recovered near the border or, or on a trail known to be used by migrants. Cases in which local police, private citizens, other migrants, volunteers or of civil society organi organizations or medical personnel are the first to come in contact with the migrants' remains may not be included in CBP's numbers. It's not common practice or standard operating procedure for CBP to contact local authorities to inquire about found remains. When the truth of forced disappearances eventually breaches the armor plating of official narratives and begins to be acknowledged, numbers remain a site of contestation. By assigning a number and claiming it represents southwest border deaths, CBP is staking a claim in our collective past, present, and future, in history, in individual memory, perception, and evaluation. Rather than reflecting the reality of death due to U.S. policy, the CBP figure much more accurately represents the number of remains recovered in certain arbitrarily and inconsistently determined zones on the U.S. side of the boundary line, and of these, only those for which CBP agents were the first responders. Nevertheless, it orients our understanding of reality because it's the official figure. It comes to represent a fair estimate of death along the border. But if we just shift one metric to include estimates for migrants killed in Mexico, the actual human cost of immigration and border policy begins to look radically different. Some civil society groups estimate that the number of migrants disappeared between 2006 and 2012 in Mexico is as high as 70,000. If we don't only measure the human cost and fatalities, but consider that individuals fit like necessary vectors in family dyads, triads, and so on, that each of these disappearances reverberates beyond the boundaries of the individual, that each represents a missing brother, sister, son, daughter, mother, father, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, best friend, confidant, or casual lover. The cost begins to feel catastrophic, and it is. It's not uncommon to visit the countryside in Mexico and find all of the young men of a certain age are gone and no one can tell you where they've gone. Families wait each day anticipating communication of any kind, communication that never comes. Loved ones of the disappeared need to know. The ambiguity becomes so unbearable that some pray simply for the knowledge, the confirmation that their loved one is dead. But an integral part of this phenomenon is the production and maintenance of ambiguity. For decades after the fact, authorities declared that there were no mass graves in Argentina, that no one had been flown in military planes, drugged, blessed by military chaplains, and dumped into the Rio de Plata off the coast of Buenos Aires. No one had been incinerated. Pope Francis, then known as Jorge Mario Bergoglio, a leader in the Jesuit order of Argentina during the Dirty War, could do nothing, say nothing. 
the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet did not scatter the remains of anyone in the Atacama. There are no mass graves in Chile. No one was ever flown over the Pacific and thrown from helicopters. Jute sacks containing bodies were not dumped in lakes and rivers throughout Chile. The Central Intelligence Agency of the United States knew nothing of it. It had not trained Pinochet's army. It had not funded them. The Sonoran Desert is not scattered with unrecovered, unidentified souls. The riverbed of the Rio Grande is not embedded with unidentified family members. There are no mass graves in the United States. So that, that is the excerpt that I chose to read. It's a bit serious. Um, and I'd like to uh, open it up for questions, uh, or if anyone would like to comment on anything, uh, I'm really open to discussing or answering questions about the book or any of the subject matter or anything anyone would like to ask or talk about today. Yes. What do you hope to accomplish? What's your main goal that you want to accomplish with this book? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a that's a very um, that's a very good question um, and a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how much faith uh, I have in the ability of writing to uh, um, contribute to any sort of social change. Um, because I'm not sure uh, if it's the truth, per se, that is um, what's missing uh, in our public discourse. I think that everyone knows what time it is. Everyone knows that these things are happening. Everyone knows that they continue to happen. Um, and yet we continue being uh, apathetic and um, inactive. So I, I, don't, I don't have very high hopes for what this book can accomplish. If anything, uh, one of the goals in writing it was to try to complicate the, the discourse around immigration. I think the national discourse that's presented in the corporate media is incredibly narrow, and it doesn't include things that are necessary to include in this discussion, like history, like all of the economic policies that influence, that compel migration. Um, serious discussions about whether or not we can claim to be a liberal democracy while excluding people based on national origin and class. Um, th those kinds of difficult questions that are necessary to ask, that journalists should be asking uh, as members of the fourth estate but you know, are not. Um, that, that, I think, is was one of the one of the hopes that perhaps I could complicate things a little bit in some small way. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you very much for being here today. Um, my name is Christina. I'm a fourth year in college. Um, how? I, I know it's a daunting task, but how can we, as a nation, as residents of this country, how can we get to a better, a better place? Because, you know, like you just mentioned, the national conversation around immigration is so limited and small and narrow, and um, it feels oftentimes like large swaths of the population, and to characterize, for example, especially like white and middle and upper middle class sectors of the population just like ignore so much of what happens and it's just they might read something about DACA and DAPA but that's about it mm -hmm. um, and are easily peddled by or like I buy into easily peddled fears about terrorists potentially coming across the southern border or any kind of border um, and so much of these complications and nuances that you're talking about here and that exist and that are so real for so many people and not just Mexicans but Central Americans and South Americans um, so much of that is lost in the role of the wall and the border and the actual circ um, sorry, um, consequences of that are so often lost. And it just, it, 
to me, I'm like, how it feels like there's people who like know that this is happening and that something's been happening. So many people that aren't even there, and it feels like we're not even having the right conversation sometimes. And how can we get to a better place, not just in the conversation, but in policy or just actual works on a grander scale? Because obviously, there's people who are working towards it, but it just feels sometimes like I just look around. Like the people I know, for example, I'm like, you don't know even what's happening. How how can we move to towards a better place? Yes, yes, that is a very good question, uh, and a very I would say it's a very big, very complicated question. Um, if we think about all of the various factors that have gotten us to the point at which we are now. These things have been centuries in the making. Uh, this has been you know, a, a killing machine that has been acquiring momentum over hundreds of years. Um, and you know, there, are various, um, there are various schools of thought uh, as to how social change happens. Um, I happen to think that it's necessary to make things very uncomfortable for people. Uh, and to um, forcefully make progress happen. I think that with many social movements, once something is accomplished, revisionists will say it was done nicely. It was done by appealing to people. It was done by signing petitions, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you know, if one were to carefully observe uh, when certain progressive goals are actually achieved, there's a lot of very real pressure. Um, you know, I think, for example, here at the University of Chicago, there was a big push for a medical center, a trauma center on the south side. And I don't think that any of the progress that has been reached by the various coalitions and groups working here uh, would have been reached without that kind of pressure, without that kind of direct action, without making people very uncomfortable and maintaining that kind of pressure on people. Um, so I think that um, it takes a diversity of tactics, and some of them nice, and some of them not so nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? How do you square away becoming a citizen? with some of your divergent feelings about America. How do I square away like? How do you, how do you, how do you become comfortable with that? Oh, I don't think, well, I mean, I don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't become comfortable with it. It is something that is, um, it, it was something that was a great relief um, because I am literally, passing into uh, full personhood. Um, I'm going from a second class human being whose equal protection that's supposed to be recognized by the Constitution is being violated. I go from that to now I'm a natural person that deserves justice and dignity. So um, it was a great relief to not be subject to all of the extra punitive measures that people who are permanent residents or who are undocumented are subject to. Um, but I don't think, uh, uh, at least I don't, I don't become comfortable with it. Um, and it's something that, you know, that if you read the um, chapter uh, that takes place during the actual ceremony, it's something that is, uh, that I undertook uh, with a lot of negative feelings in bad faith. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew that entering into this transaction of becoming a citizen is underwriting that kind of structure that says, in order to be granted what every human being is supposed to be granted, you need to be a citizen and you need to be, you need to qualify in these ways and you need to jump through these hoops and perform uh, your moral goodness in order to receive something that should always already be yours. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know that I, I ever do. Um, in fact, it seems like I become more and more uncomfortable with it as time goes on. <coughs> I have three bottles of water back here. Thoughts on borders? What? What are your thoughts on borders, countries? You know, like 
having borders. Just every country has a border, and they all enforce them in different ways. So, yeah, what's your thoughts on, on countries having borders? Well, I think that <clears throat> borders, ha as a as a word, as a category, as a delineation, have meant very different things historically over time, uh, and depending also on the region we're talking about, um, but. The way that we think about national boundaries and national borders today is actually there's there's a there's a feeling and perception that these things are natural and they're inevitable. The border as it exists, or that there needs to be a border, feels very natural and intuitive, um, but it isn't. It's actually a very recent political category that's been created. The border existing as it does and inscribing people in the way it does when people come across it is a very recent and also a political, um, uh, it's political in nature. Um, so my thoughts are that uh, borders as they exist today exist for the purpose of affluent countries not having to deal with the consequences of the misery that they create else elsewhere. If you look at migrant flows, and if you look at what compels migration, very often the countries that are receiving migrants are the ones that decimated the countries from which the migrants are coming. And then on top of that, once migrants have to leave those countries, they say, you can't come in here. Uh, or you can come in here in a certain way as a second class person. Um, so, I mean, that pretty much sums it up <laughs> in terms of how I feel about borders. Um, I don't think they're necessary. I don't think they're inevitable. I don't think they're natural. I think they're very recent. And I think that their primary goal is to uh, inscribe people with vulnerabilities that can be exploited economically and politically. Yes? Can you uh, speak uh, and give us some information about the, uh, the groups that you have oh, yes. found at the border? Uh, that would you sign as a volunteer for no more deaths, for uh, the other group that is called Colibri, the work that they're doing? Uh, if you can please yes. yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think someone else in the audience has volunteered with No More Deaths, Hannah over there. Um, yeah, No More Deaths is a, an incredible organization that works along the US-Mexico border, uh, and it does several things. It leaves uh, water on migrant trails, uh, it um, provides emergency medical assistance, and all, it also documents abuse in short-term border patrol custody, and it uh, documents other forms of abuse and uh, gathers data. Um, the chapter that I read talks about some of the importance of that data and information. Um, so I think that's, that's a, an incredibly important thing to do because as governments wage war or wage the kind of um, military tactics that are being waged along the U.S.-Mexico border or elsewhere, they are not um, going to expend great effort in order to document and record the atrocities that they commit. So groups have to step in and collect that data because it becomes very important in terms of, um, I think Donna Haraway says, what stories, it matters what stories tell stories. Um, and if that data isn't collected, then the official narrative stands. Um, so No More Deaths is one group. Frontera de Cristo is an affiliated group that runs the Migrant Resource Center. Um, they have one in Agua Prieta, Sonora, and they have one in Nogales. Uh, and they do incredible work. And then the Colibri Center uh, in Arizona is, is, uh, is an incredible organization that also works to produce this data that is not being produced. Um, so those are all incredible organizations. Everyone should look into them. And I'm sure that Hannah can also give you her perspective and answer questions about her experience at no, in volunteering with No More Deaths. Um, but they're incredible uh, groups that are doing incredibly difficult work uh, in incredibly difficult circumstances without funding, without um, 
very much assistance. So, yes. What's the next step for you with the report? You're doing more readings and then beyond that. Yes. Um, well, I uh, I'm just doing some more readings, and uh, hopefully, I, I hope that uh, there's some interest in translating the book. Um, I would love for the book to be translated, uh, especially into Spanish. Um, and uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what comes next. This is my first time doing this, so I have no idea what comes next. And I've been really <coughs> winging it, playing it by ear. Well, no, my first uh, book. I think it's like my fourth reading. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To uh, add to that question, um, you are moving to New Mexico soon, which a large portion of the population. Uh, are still illegal or they have illegal parents and I mean even the IDs from there are not really counted in airports so do you think you will become more involved in organizations there closer to the border or possibly do more research for another book? Yes, yes very much. Um, yeah, I've already, uh, I'm moving to uh, New Mexico in the coming months and um, I've been reading about the state of New Mexico, its history and its current situation and there's overwhelming poverty in New Mexico and that's something that I'm very interested in um, investigating and becoming uh, immersed in. Um, there, there are also, you know, in New Mexico and southern Arizona and, and, uh, and in other places in the southwest, uh, there are various Native American reservations where, of course, this is another huge, huge uh, consideration that's never taken into account when we talk about immigration, for example. Uh, what right does a settler colonial nation have to say we're erecting this immigration apparatus? What right does the American Border Patrol have to pull over uh, Tohono O'odham people who live on their land on a daily basis? Um, when they're traveling from their home to the store, to school, back home, whatnot. Um, so those are all things that I, I'm, you know, I, I, I look forward to um, becoming involved with. Yes? Do you think the record-breaking numbers in the deportation app, is it more like a state-to-state -state thing or is it a national policy thing? Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting, um, I think it's an interesting dynamic that happens uh, with immigration in terms of states versus the federal level. Um, uh, of course, Obama has, has had the most uh, successful, if you want to call it, uh, deportation regime that we, that we know. Um, and this is done on a federal level. Uh, and in all of the research that I did for the book and investigating the various political uh, influences that that may have contributed to this enactment of this uh, deportation regime, especially for someone like Obama, who is a civil rights attorney, community or organizer, stuff like that. Uh, I think that you find a very similar pattern uh, uh, as other Democrats who are attempting to garner political capital or to signal politically certain things so that they can then expend that political capital elsewhere. And immigration becomes a very convenient sort of lever to signal tough on this, tough on that, in order to sort of garner that kind of support, whatever, and then use it elsewhere. Um, I think it's also uh, really, um, it's a diversionary tactic in many ways, the relationship between federal and state immigration uh, laws and procedures. Uh, like, if you take the example of Arizona, Arizona enacted this incredibly draconian immigration measure, and uh, the, the, the sheriff, Joe Arpaio of Arizona, became this sort of figure uh, in this anti-immigrant moment. And it becomes a kind of political theater where Obama is in the process of deporting 2.5 million people, but the attention is diverted to Joe Arpaio because he has tent city and jails outside and this, uh, you know, this sort of excessive showy uh, kind of violations. 
But while Obama is still deporting 2.5 million people, he tell he says, you know, and he creates this story in the media that Joe Arpaio is very bad, he shouldn't be doing this, and he fights against Joe Arpaio so that some progressives, some Democrats watching this are, are thinking to themselves, oh, he's doing, you know, he's doing something, when in fact, at the very same time, he's continuing to deport record-breaking numbers of people. Um, so I think that that relationship is interesting. There are also some researchers that are doing really interesting work on the relationship and similarities between fugitive state, uh, I'm sorry, fugitive slave laws uh, and the relationship between state and federal immigration enforcement. So when the federal government deputizes state law enforcement to capture and return immigrants who have crossed certain borders. There are many similarities between those laws and they share, uh, they share a kind of lineage. Yes? Hey, do you, um, do you think that the I mean, if, you, if you're hoping for, for your book to have effect, uh, to bring about some kind of change, then it seems as though college students would benefit most by reading it. Have you had any, I mean, do you know of any colleges picking up your book as part of an immigration course? Um, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, uh, um, if any colleges are, are using it uh, sort of curriculum wide. I know that the publisher that puts out this book uh, does a lot of work uh, in promoting it in university libraries and campuses and stuff like that. Um, but it's too soon to know. It was published April 12th. Um, so I, yeah, so I don't, um, I don't know exactly what is coming. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully, um, I know a few colleagues of mine, for example, that teach uh, essay writing or nonfiction writing are teaching the book uh, just in terms of genre, uh, essay, or, or uh, nonfiction, or memoir. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've talked to a few other individual um, educators who have used the book, some high school teachers, um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure where it'll, it'll end up or what kind of life it'll have um, in the future. Has anyone from your high school read it? I mean, have you given it to I've read, I've read it. I went to high school. <laughs> um, I, I actually had a, I actually had a comment and a question. Sure. If I could segue. Um, so you actually read one of my favorite uh, single single uh, sentences that are kind of next to each other. Uh, and I had this little dog ear, and I motioned to my neighbor so she can be my witness. Uh, where you said a disappearance is said to have occurred when someone something ceases to be visible. In case of human disappearance. This definition could not be further from the truth. When a person disappears, the missing becomes hyper-visible, hyper-present. And in moments like that, I, I just I just love that. Like, you wrote the shit out of this book. Uh, I think it was great. Um, but there's also a lot of humor in it. So I had a question about some of the more, I think, uh, bold decisions and that I, I find even humor it in a way, in a dark way. Um, and I'm wondering in terms of reactions, even though it's recently published, is there anything that's been surprising to you or something that you knew you'd get a rea certain reaction to, a certain piece? And, and, and I want to preface that by saying, uh, even on the first page, you say something that's pretty bold. You talk about, in the chapter, you're talking about a president you know, dining at an establishment where you're, where you're working amongst immigrants, right? You say, <laughs> upon noticing the Secret Service agents kind of weapons or imagining them, the, the bulges through their vests, you say, I picture one of the customers being cut down by a short, I don't know what that word is, uh, burst, I imagine, penetrated by three rounds diagonally across the chest, or perhaps two individual rounds from two separate trigger squeezes. And then you go into <laughs> some other little tirade. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's better in context, but yeah. <laughs> I thought that was really bold to, I mean, you must be on some kind of list now, to even <laughs> have that imagery and the president dining in the same, but I'm sure there's new port calls now, mm -hmm. but has there, in terms of reactions to the book, is there anything maybe with the president being in it or anything else that's kind of surprised you that you're kind of expecting? Yeah, um, you know, 
Um, yeah, the humor. I mean, you would know, right? Uh, <laughs> I have, you know, I have a very sick sense of humor. Um, and um, yeah, that comes through in the book, I think, in certain ways. Some people don't read it as a humor, though, you know? Some people are like, what is this? Um, but yeah, other people who share in that kind of sick sense of humor pick up on where there are funny parts. Um, and I, you know, I mean, it's one of those situations where, like, the subject matter and the reality of it is so devastating. And so much of the book is also so relentlessly devastating that, like, even myself as a writer, I just found myself cracking into humor because I was either going to laugh or I was going to cry or I was going to bash my head into the wall or something, you know. Um, there's that, you know, Chappelle quote. I'm sure you know that one. Um, you know, they're like, ah, this racism is killing me. And he laughs um, because what else do you do? Um, but, yeah, uh, uh, the second part of your question was the humor and then... Um. If there's oh, any part of the reaction that right. surprised you, that's right. The reaction that you, is there something you're like, oh, once this gets out, that people are going to react this way to this thing, or is yeah. there something that surprised you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I I haven't had any sort of um, a scary uh, scary sort of uh, reactions yet for for this book. I had I wrote a thing that was uh, published on BuzzFeed where uh, the Corrections Corporation of America (CCA) like within like like within like three, four, I don't even know, it was like within minutes of it going live, mm -hmm. they like emailed the editor saying that you need to issue a correction for this one thing. That was like, I wrote uh, this thing about um, certain politicians being in the same room in a conference center as these private enterprise individuals and that they were all there together while this legislation was written and I implied very directly that they wrote it together and CCA wanted a correction issued saying very clearly that they were in the same room, but it was not, the language and verbiage was never decided on together. There was no communication about that, whatever. So, you know, one of the largest prison organizations, the biggest prison, you know, private prison corporations uh, does that within minutes. I was kind of like, oh, so. Um, but, um, yeah, nothing from the book. I mean, I don't know, man, like, people don't read. I think maybe like, you know, 15 people will read it and they'll be like, oh man, but I don't, I don't know if enough people read for it to be, you know, a thing. Um, I was worried about my um, certain part of the book uh, in terms of my, um, the, my fiance and I are getting married very soon. And there's a portion of the book that uh, just very quickly touches on um, my uh, future mother-in-law. So I was very worried about that. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, she loved she loved the book, and she's a you know lovely individual, and like you know, there was no issue or anything. But that, I think that was the thing that I was the most worried about. Uh, was her reaction. Um, but everything is cool so far. <laughs> yes. I have another question. Um, how much of censorship do you have to deal with, or have you dealt with during these your publications in general, including yeah. the book? Because yeah. I know there's a lot, but I yeah. You know, that's a very interesting question, and and uh, especially in the United States. Um, you know, uh, I think, um, you know, the only real instance of like censorship per se uh, was I attempted to visit a, a, a private prison, an immigrant detention center, and I was told by the PR person at the detention center that I could not be allowed to visit because I would be violating the privacy of the individuals who were being kept without charge extrajudiciously. Um, so I was not allowed to go to the prison to, to gain access to the prison in any way. Um, but uh, other than that, I'm not sure if, um, like, for example, in the chapter that I've read, the figure, 6,330, that's an official figure. And I needed to interrogate that because it stands as the official figure. Uh, there's no censorship in terms of this is the figure, th this is a reality that's happening. But there is a lot of, um, a lot of 
control and manufacturing of that figure and of that official narrative. Um, I think that censorship in the United States occurs in direct ways very, um, very carefully. Um, but I think that, you know, like I think uh, Mario Vargas Llosa said it best that we live in a state of like a dictadura perfecta, you know? Dissidents who would strongly criticize are given awards, uh, are given posts with great salaries, are, they ascend somehow, you know? Uh, Octavio Paz won a Nobel Prize in Mexico, you know? Um, different authors didn't. Uh, here in the United States, I think that happens a lot, and I think that um, the road for people who are doing the hardest, most valuable kind of work, people are always encouraged in very subtle ways to not do that kind of work. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I would say that I've uh, encountered any instances of censorship, but certainly there's an uphill battle in writing anything uh, real, in any kind of real way, you know. Um, so, so I don't know if that answers. Can you speak the prize view sometime in the future? Then? Do what? Can you speak the prize, the prize view? A prize? Sometime? Yeah, my, um, I think my mom made, uh, like, uh, she's, she knitted a bow. That she's gonna <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know about anything like that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I've always been really curious about, like, the, you know, like the mass deportation, how, how, how it like picked up, and, and it's ties to like financial gains for, for companies. Like some people make money off of it, otherwise it wouldn't be such a huge effort. Mm -hmm. Like you know, uh, did you get any any sort of research on that? Like any sort of uh, information on that? Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know there are certain uh, private interests and corporations that directly make money from deportation, but they that's not the majority of. Uh, I, w I would say that that is still somewhat slim. I think that um, your impulse is correct in to say somebody's gaining from this and it's done in a deliberate way. But I think you have to look sometimes several steps down the line and in ways that may not immediately appear uh, directly related. Um, and that's where you begin to see the relationships between interests pushing for certain things and and not pushing for certain things. I think there's a very fine line that the United States walks with uh, immigration. And the, the thing that I found is that it's valuable uh, for it to remain in flux so that the government can push and pull when it finds it necessary to do so. And certain politicians take advantage of that ability to push and pull when they find it necessary to do so. So when the United States, certain sectors of the economy need um, malleable, exploitable, somewhat cheap, uh, um, very uh, transient forms of labor, that happens. And when that kind of labor has been done and it's time for you know, that to finish up, or there's an economic downturn, suddenly we see a lot of uh, talking heads appearing being allowed to appear on television, given a lot of airtime, saying it's the immigrants, it's the immigrants, it's the immigrants. It's, it wasn't the bankers, it wasn't you know uh, Wall Street, it wasn't uh, over-the-counter derivatives. It was your neighbor or the guy that lives over here, or whatever. Um, so I think it's you know the direct link is not uh, you know extremely. It's not a big uh, sort of a big kind of one-to-one -one direct relationship. Um, but there are many, many, many interests that gain in various ways um, that are kind of indirect or somewhat shadowy. <clears throat> yes? I know you focus on, you know, Latin American immigration and stuff like that. Uh, have you looked, like, back and seen the, the push and pull from the very beginning about immigration? From, I mean, even before the Civil yeah. War, slavery, immigration. Like how these things sort of like uh, pulled against each other, and how the government has responded to that. Yeah. Time? Like, what do you, I yes. About? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So there was a you know. I, I um I researched all that history very extensively, and um, I didn't want the book to be a history text um, because these things are, you know, all of these different. Um, countries, time periods, 
have a vast history, and it's all very, very interesting. Um, you know, for example, there's one thing that I do touch on in the book uh, that talks about how during, uh, you know, during an, an, an era where there was a very large need for labor, but uh, the, the United States government also wanted to exclude certain kinds of people. They excluded uh, people from China, but they, these anti-immigrant laws didn't consider Latin Americans immigrants. They considered them laborers. So they were exempt from, from any sort of application of this law so that they could have labor while pushing out a, a different group. And there are many time periods where this occurs. There are many di different circumstances when that occurs. Like the, the thing I mentioned earlier between the, the historical lineage between the actual laws from fugitive slave laws to the kind of immigration paradigm that we have today is incredible. It's an incredible history. And there, there are very few researchers that are writing about that lineage. And it's quite direct. Um, if you do read the research that exists, it's quite direct, and there are many similarities. And that's also part of the part of the thing, like what stories tell stories. You know, we there's no there's no uh, discussion of that relationship, fugitive slave laws and immigration. There's also no discussion of like, for example, the atrocity of Japanese internment camps after World War II. How is immigrant detention extrajudicial based on country of origin and class? How's that similar? And how's it different? Why don't we consider it as atrocious? With time, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, in the future, people will look back and say, wow, that was atrocious. But right now, as it's happening, those stories aren't, you don't hear those stories anywhere. You don't read those reframings um, anywhere. So, yeah, that's, I wanted to address. So, follow up, why do you think? You, this is something we've been grappling with for so long. Why do you think this remains a problem without a solution, even an imperfect solution? You know, like you know, like you're talking about complicating the argument, but you know, I guess so people pick up books because they want answers, mm -hmm. not questions. You know, mm -hmm. do you like? Well, how do you how do you feel about that? Uh, how do I feel about? Well, not giving people answers. Not giving people answers. Well, I would Why say. Why do you think we've never found an answer? You know, like. Well, I would say. Like that, yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. I would say that um, different historical periods have come and gone, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that I think I think that the answer that uh, what is desired has been happening over time. Things have been happening and functioning exactly as people in power want them to. And that's in flux, changing over time, people forgetting, stuff happening, stuff happening again, cycling through. If you look at other uh, phenomena that the United States does, for example, uh, look at the United States foreign and military policy in Latin America during the Cold War, and now look at the Middle East. How similar are those circumstances? Incredibly similar. Counterinsurgencies, counterinsurgencies, proxy warfare happening, various interests. I mean. These are, these are things that are repeated. History repeats itself. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, that's a very complex question. The, why do the people in power not offer a solution? Because they don't, they don't want a genuine solution. A solution would be so fundamental that it, it requires, it requires a, a um, you know, it requires a, a restructuring of the structures of exploitation that exist here. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they don't want to happen. So, and in terms of providing answers, I mean, this has been a, a problem that has been in the works, that has been uh, happening and being produced for a hundred years by many people. So I would say, I'm not here to provide answers. I'm here to point my finger at everyone involved to try to complicate this narrative. And I would say that it's it's a collective responsibility to face some very difficult and some very hard truths and then try to un-F things as much as possible. I think we're...
is, I don't know, I'm not keeping track of time if anyone else is. But does anyone have any final questions? Final questions? Yes. Uh, Spanish speaking media, Univision, Telemundo. Uh, your own point of view uh, about immigration, specifically about immigration. How important or what do you think the importance of the information they've been releasing uh, about immigration and the immigration problem in general? Mm -hmm. uh, on your own point of view, the formation of consent through that information, the misinformation, mm -hmm. the manipulation of that information. Yeah. How much does that take an effect into the real problem? Yeah. Well, I would say that if you watch the news or media in Spanish, there's a little bit more attention paid to immigration, but only in a certain way. It's the kind of attention that will get ratings, but it's not the kind of attention that actually complicates uh, or asks fundamental questions. Uh, in, in very few regards is it fundamentally um, substantially different. And you know, if you look at who owns these media networks, you know, similar people, the same people, uh, if you look at even the media in Latin American countries, it's the same thing. There's no fourth estate. It's all manufacturing of consent, like you said. It's all this very narrow narrative, this very narrow story, the same story told over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can I just ask, after that, as a follow-up to that question, like, what is that narrative? What is that narrow narrative? It's like, I'm, I mean, I've watched Univision before, but like my Spanish is so poor that like it's, you know, so like what would, how would you identify that narrative on Spanish speaking yeah. media? Yeah. I would say that it's, uh, in, in, in nature, it's the same as any other sort of 24 hour news cycle. Uh, it's blips of the very tip of excess. You know, this is a, this is a horrible thing that happened. That's it. There's no, uh, I mean, in my view, the role of the media, the role of the fourth estate is to confront power with truthful and difficult questions. Um, and that, you know, I don't, I don't know where that happens. I mean, you know, Jorge Ramos, uh, ha, you know, engages in a bit of, you know, perhaps lukewarm, difficult questioning. Uh, but it's, I, in my opinion, that's purely for political theater. And it's very, I mean, to me, it's half-stepping. Uh, he's, you know, he resembles a journalist, yeah. sort of. Um, that may be a bit harsh, but. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Like Anderson Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so, oh, oh yes, yes, no, of course. Of course, yeah. Like you mentioned, this, this issue that you hold for us, it is a very complicated issue, and I know it's been going on for such a long time, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned that the political figures and the leaders that we have on that issue are not very prominent at this point. So do you see yourself, and touching on the, what you mentioned, social change, as sort of a vessel sort of to start that conversation of social change in that this whole political and immigration issue. Do you see yourself like a, maybe someone that we can see that is really starting to make that ball rolling into a better? I know it's a complicated <laughs> question. I mean, I mean, I mean, but. Yeah, um, I mean, um, I think you know. I, I think it takes it takes it takes many people. It takes um, all kinds of tactics uh, on all levels, grassroots all the way to you know legislative measures. Um, I don't I don't I don't know what you know what kind of life this book will have. Um, but for me, in writing it, you know, it was just like a salvo 
throw a salvo and do it as hard as you can and then see what happens. And that's, I mean, yeah. that, that's basically it. Um, and then continue, you know, continue doing that as much as I can. And also continue working with these different organizations, like with my body, uh, not just on the page, but you know, going there, doing those things. Um, and that's, I mean, I don't have, I'm out of ideas at that point. I don't, I don't know um, what, what better way or what else. Um, but I mean, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, um, people will read the book and will come away with more questions and maybe a little bit of rage uh, because, you know, I think it's time for some rage. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you.